Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Vaed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, v'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Baruch Hashem. God wants us to experience, especially during this season of return, the forgiveness that transcends anything we could go through. Whatever the challenges, whatever the weight, whatever the oppression may be, forgiveness has a way of lifting the load and setting us free. So we're going to begin with forgiven. I'm forgiven in your name I'm forgiven And a great weight is lifted Forgiven Like a stone rolled away Forgiven By the gift I've been given Forgiven When you removed all my shame and I will never be the same And by forgiving others I can be forgiven By forgiving others I can be set free Forgiving others, I can be forgiven. By forgiving others, they have no hold on me. And by forgiving others, we can be forgiven. By forgiving others, the 
torment is gone By forgiving others we can be forgiven By forgiving others we can now move on So I'm forgiven And a great weight is lifted Forgiven Just like a stone rolled away Forgiven for all the sins I've committed Forgiven of all my guilt and my shame Cause I'm forgiven in your name I'm forgiven Cause I'm forgiven in your name Yes, I'm forgiven And I will never be the same No more guilt and no more shame No excuses and no blame Cause I'm forgiven in your name you know, it's funny, but no matter how great, sometimes people think if they have a really good excuse, that lets you off the hook. But I have found over time, no excuse, no matter how good it is, is a valid substitute for doing what God is calling us to do and to be. And we don't want excuses. We don't want to toss blame to others. We want to take charge and let God take charge in our lives and give us that freedom that only he can bring, that freedom of the oppression of sin. And to be forgiven requires us to also be able to forgive others. And I say this often, but forgiveness is not letting them off the hook. It's letting us off the hook so we can move on without being paralyzed and held by somebody who isn't even around to control us. But if that unforgiveness is there, it keeps us bound. And God wants to set us free. He wants us to return to him. And during this season, today is Shabbat Shuvah, the Sabbath of return. And I've mentioned this every year for 57 years. It's my the 57th anniversary of my bar mitzvah. And this was my Haftorah portion this week. And uh, it says, return to the Lord your God for your fallen by your iniquities. And this idea, this season of return in this day, Shabbat Shuva, the Sabbath of return, is a reminder that God is planning to return. But he wants us to return first so we can experience the wonder of his blessings to open up the doors of our heart and to bring deliverance and to bring us all the benefits of his kingdom, the return. Open the door, return and restore. With love and affection, with full fair's attention, Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. Oh yes, return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection, with full fair's attention, Shuva the Kuma, return and restore, cause it's you we adore. So far away, you said the day and returned. Yes, you returned. You said, Return now to me, so your life can be set free from all your captivity. And I will return to you, cause 
your exile now is through And I'll rebuild you just like new So Lord, return in your power Come back and shower us with love and affection With full face attention Shuva the Kuma Return and restore It's you we adore Return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection. We give full face attention. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. It's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. Cause you're all we live for. Oh yes, return in your power. Come back and shower us with love and affection. We make full face connection. Return and restore, cause it's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. Open the door, return and restore. Oh Lord, open the door. wants us to return and be restored. God is waiting in the wings to bring all of these things to pass as we open our hearts to him and return. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. We're so glad you're here today with us. And we're grateful for all that God is doing. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. Our desire is to see the move of God's spirit come in a way that takes the scriptures, puts Messiah back into that original Jewish context, and is able to present for all people an understanding of what Yeshua meant by the words that he said. He, most of his words were reflected in the Torah, and he was elaborating on it. For instance, when he said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, he wasn't saying, you've heard it said this, but let's do the opposite. What he did was he always went to the heart of the issue. So when he said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, he said, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But I say to you, if you have hatred in your hearts, you're committing murder already. And it's so interesting that when we talk about Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, there's something about executing somebody's credibility and who they are, attacking their self-worth and their reputation. And in Judaism, it's often thought to be as, as devastating as murder itself because you're murdering a soul, you're murdering the reputation. And so what Yeshua did, he always went to the heart of the issue. It wasn't just the words, follow this, and these are the minimal things you have to do to get by. He always went to the very core, to the heart of it, that if you allow these things to linger, they will express themselves in ways that you don't really want to. We don't want to say afterwards, why did I do that? I wish I hadn't said that. You can't get those words back. And so we need to understand that Yeshua is wanting us to be set free. And he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he is the way, the truth and the life. He is the one who brings us understanding through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit to bring us understanding and insight, to come and be that comforter within us, that one to lead us and guide us into all truth. And to take, he says, he'll take of mine and reveal it to you. And we'll come and make our home in you. That's what God ultimately wants throughout the scriptures. To be our God and for us to be his people and for him to make his dwelling within us. And it's just so exciting. 
for what God is doing. And we're grateful for God to bring these things about. If you brought your tithes and offerings, the tenth and the offering, we have a basket in the back. If you prefer to do it by the internet with PayPal on our website, go to bethzion.org. Uh, if you would like to do it by mail, you can send that to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we appreciate all of your prayers, all of your generous support, and the way that God is knitting us together as a people to have impact in our region around us and see people come to know the Lord and to know and understand the intimacy that he wants to make available to us. Avinu Malkeno, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. Speak to us during this special Shabbat, Shabbat Shuvah, the Sabbath of return, and turn our hearts more effectively to you than ever before, that we would see the abundance of your blessing poured out upon each one of us and upon our families and upon our neighbors and upon this region during this season of return. We thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, today's portion is called Vayelech. Vayelech means he went and is taken from Devarim, Deuteronomy 31, where it says, Moshe went and spoke the following words to all Israel. I'm 120 years old today. I can't get around any longer. Moreover, the Lord has said to me, you will not cross the Yarden. Hashem, your God, he will cross over ahead of you. He'll destroy these nations ahead of you and you will dispossess them. Joshua, he will cross over ahead of you. As Hashem has said, Hashem will do to them what he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amori, and to their land, he destroyed them. Hashem defeated them ahead of you, and you are to do to them just as I have ordered you to do. Be strong, be bold, don't be afraid or frightened of them, for Hashem your God is going with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. One of the things that we talk about as a big factor in life is fear, the fear factor. Fear has torment, but perfect love casts out fear. And one of the things that people fear more than anything else is a fear of abandonment, a fear of being alone, a fear of somehow having to navigate by themselves, feeling lost, feeling like there's maybe even sometimes the people that we call friends seem to be distant, seem to be non-existent offended and walking away. It's amazing how frivolous some of these reasons can be. And yet the feeling of abandonment is a very powerful fear. And what we're calling as a title for this is return of abandoned people. The return of abandoned people. And on this Shabbat, the Sabbath of return, it is talking about God wanting to bring us back to himself. And I find it amazing. Last week we spoke about uh, the portion where it talks about that even if you go to the end of the earth, I will go there and get you and bring you back. There is a heart that God has for us of calling us to return, of calling us to come back not just because he's lonely. In fact, that isn't the reason he wants to be with us. But he wants to be able to bestow on us all the benefits of his kingdom and to make these things real for us. He says to them, and he says to Joshua, be strong, be bold, don't be afraid or frightened of them, those who are in the land who seem to be so ruthless and seem to be so casual with the idea of human life. It seems like we're living in a time now where we see this happening and rising in cities all over where 
injustices are happening, where murder is on the rise, where people are disrespecting one another, people pushing people into train tracks, uh, other people blindsiding somebody with a punch to the head and causing brain damage and just standing over with this feeling of superiority that just because they wanted to. It seems like it's a very callous world at times. And yet God wants to take what seems abandoned or take what seems like there's no solution and provide a solution of life. This is God's call to return. We turn, we return to something, but we also return from something. We return from all those things that have caused us to experience all these calamities. And God has a way of bringing our attention to what it is we need to do. It isn't looking for somebody else to be the scapegoat or make excuse. But we need to press in and take hold of what God has for us. And so we can feel abandoned sometimes. And there are some passages we're going to look at where God is making his presence known in a way. He says again, I mentioned before, he says, your God is going with you. Your God is going with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. That is an amazingly comforting set of words to consider that the creator of all things cares about each one of us. Doesn't want us to feel abandoned, wants us to be restored, wants us to experience what it is to have him taking residence within us. It's a very powerful God that we serve. And it's, a, it's amazing all that he wants to do. He says just a little bit further down, next Moses summoned Joshua. And in the sight of all Israel, he said to him, again, the same thing, be strong, be bold, for you are going with this people into the land. Hashem swore to your ancestors that he would give you. You will be the one causing them to inherit it. We might wonder, well, we're not Joshua. He was trying to fill Moses' sandals. But each one of us has an input, something to impart to others, something of that heavenly investment that God has put within us, each making us individuals with a gift from God. That gift, that gift varies from person to person, but it should never be something that's taken for granted. He says this, it is he who will go ahead of you. Again, saying that he's with us. He will go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. So don't be afraid or downhearted. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not afraid. But maybe you're downhearted. Maybe you're feeling like the value of life has diminished in some way. But this is what God was doing, saying through Moses to encourage the people because they were about to get ready to enter into the land of promise, to go into battle with all of those forces that were so destructive in the land already. And he warns them, as we said before, and we went over a number of these passages, that God was going to was going to bring them into the land of promise. But he says to them, don't be afraid of the people and don't try to practice their ways of doing things. Don't be influenced by the world around you. Don't be intimidated by people saying, oh, you believe that stuff? What's wrong with you? Oh, no, I, I, I don't want to be, I'm not, you know, I don't want to get carried away, but okay. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's not the kind of a thing that we need to be intimidated. We need to move forward in what God is calling us to do. He says to them, and we have mentioned this in the portion, Joel, we talked about that a little bit on, on Rosh Hashanah. But he says, verse 12, 
assemble the people, the men, the women, the little ones, and the foreigners you have in your towns so that they can hear, learn, fear Hashem your God and take care to obey all the words of this Torah. And so that their children who have not known can hear and learn to fear the Lord your God for as long as you're in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. And he basically lays out all these different points with them. I want to look for a moment at the Haftorah portion, which is from Hosea, and uh, kind of do this every year at this time. But um, this was my Haftorah portion when I had my bar mitzvah. And I used to tell my mom, I used to tell my mom whenever I got to do my portion, I said, Mom, I'm doing my portion, my Haftorah portion again, only this time I know what I'm talking about. You know, and, and if you've ever, if you grew up in the synagogue, they would, if you didn't have it written out, they would write it for you or they would direct how you did your speech and stuff like that. And um, I remember one time when I was speaking at a congregation that was looking for a rabbi and I didn't know that they were, but I thought, gee, this would be really cool. It was seven years to the day that I had become a believer and 13 years to the Shabbat of my bar mitzvah. And I had told my mom, mom, I did my bar mitzvah text today, only this time I know what I'm talking about. And it says this, it says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquities. Take with you words and return. In the Hebrew, it was, Shuva Yisrael, Adonai Elohecho, Kuchashalto Bavonecho, Kehu Imachem Devarim, Veshuvel Adonai, and then on and on with it. And every year I like to just chant that opening part of it because it's such a powerful love message to God. He says, Return to the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquities. Now, you would think that if it was us, we'd say, don't bother returning. You've fallen by your iniquities. Don't come back here again because you missed the mark. But God doesn't always look at it as the final fatal thing that's happened in us. He says, return to the Lord your God for you've fallen by your iniquities. Take with you words and return. And why does he say take with you words and return. It wasn't just words, but we take those words, we express with our lips our desire to do this. You know, at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we talk about for the sins that have committed against him, all the different things that possibly could be. And it isn't just the words. For some, it is just empty words. You say it by rote. It should never be by rote but by action as well. And he says, take with you words and return. Make shuva, come back, forgive all guilt and accept what is good. We will pay instead of bulls, the offering of our lips. And then he says, I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely for my anger has turned from him. I find it amazing when we think about, if we think about our relationship with God like a love story or like vows that are made at a wedding, I, I don't think anyone considers vows the way that God does. If we were disloyal to our spouse, they might have reason to say, I don't have to take this anymore. But he says, I'll heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. This is God's heart. There are places, and we'll look at some, in fact, just in, in the portion that was read last week in Isaiah, it spoke about these things, Isaiah 62. First, we heard God's heart 
where Yeshua quoted when he came out of the wilderness experience, 40 days in the wilderness during the time of the reading of Devarim, Deuteronomy. And he quotes from those places when he's challenged by the adversary. And then he comes out, and the first thing he does, he goes into the synagogue that he grew up in. And they hand him the scroll from Yeshayahu, from Isaiah. And he read, it says it rolled to where it said, because the portion starts at verse 10. They didn't have the verses marked then. But he rolled back to the beginning of that section and said, the spirit of Hashem Elohim is upon me because Hashem has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to let out into light those bound in the dark, to proclaim the year of the favor of the Lord. He says they will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore sites long destroyed. They will renew the ruined cities destroyed many generations ago. We can look at our cities today and wonder if they can be repaired. And yet God is in the repair business. He's in the restoration business. He says down a little bit further in chapter 62, again, he, he says, you will be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. You will no longer be spoken of as Azuva, abandoned, or your land be spoken of as, as, as Shimama, desolate. Rather, you will be called Hefseva, my delight is in her, and your land, Beulah, married. For Hashem delights in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, your sons will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, your God will rejoice over you. He speaks of this very much in the same way of marital vows. His commitment is like no other commitment. He is always looking for return, for people to come back, to remove that sense of abandonment and to return and be restored. This is something very powerful. Again, at the end of that chapter, chapter 62, he says, they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. You will be called derusha, sought after. Irlo ne'ezva, city no longer abandoned. He talks about raising up the ancient ruins, raising up the foundations of generations past, looking and seeing as we saw some passages in the in the recent few weeks, passages of saying they've lost their children. They've been taken over. And then seeing children returning and saying, who are these? Who are these? These are the restoration once again coming back. God bringing his promise to fruition for them. There's also, as we look this past week during Rosh Hashanah, we looked for a moment at Joel chapter 2, and we saw in verse 15, it said, blow the shofar in Zion, proclaim a holy fast, call for a solemn assembly. And here, similar to what was read in the portion that we did before, he says, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the leaders, gather the children, even infants sucking at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride, the bridal chamber. Let the Kohens who serve Hashem stand weeping between the vestibule and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Hashem. Don't expose your heritage to mockery and make them a byword among the goyim of the nations. Why should the people say, where is their God? There is something about God wanting to restore, and we blow the shofar during Rosh Hashanah. We blow the shofar during these 10 days of awe that we, and we sound an alarm. He said in chapter 2, the beginning of it, he said, blow the shofar in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all living in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's upon us. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick fog, 
A great and mighty horde is spreading like blackness over the mountains. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again. And he talks about these things, he says, not even after the years of many generations. So what is he talking about? A very devastating thing. And then calls the people to return, to repent, to fast and to pray. Not just the elders, but all of the people, even down to the children who are sucking at their mother's breast. Blow a shofar in Zion, proclaim a holy fast, call a solemn assembly. And then we see that he says in chapter 3, which is also quoted in Acts, when they said, these people are drunk. He said, they're not drunk as you suppose. It says, and he quotes from this, it says, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also on the male and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the sky, on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. And he describes a very powerful move of his spirit. And Kepha, Peter, identified what was going on when the outpouring of God's spirit came during Shavuot, Pentecost. He says, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel, pouring out his spirit. And isn't that the process of what God does? He calls us to return. We are abandoned and feel abandoned because we have removed ourselves from the Lord, followed our own ways and have been led astray. Each one turned to his own way, but the Lord laid on him a Messiah, the iniquity of us all. He made provision for us to be able to return. And so we see this idea of returning, restoring, reconciling. All of these are a part of what God wants to do when he sees us standing in a place of either abandonment or feeling like we've been abandoned. And his heart's desire is for us to return. Again, not because he has some kind of a problem and needs to have people around or white noise going on or people coming in, but he is wanting to manifest all of the blessings that he speaks about in the Torah as being a part of what he wants to do. When we look at chapter 5 of Romans... He says this, beginning of verse 1. So since we have come to be considered righteous by God because of our trust, let us continue to have shalom, peace with God through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Also through him and on the ground of our trust, we have gained access to this grace in which we stand. So let us boast about the hope of experiencing God's glory. But not only that, let us boast in our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And this hope does not let us down because God's love for us has already been poured out in our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Messiah died on behalf of ungodly people. Now, it is rare even for when someone gives up his life, even for the sake of someone righteous. People say, I'll take a bullet for you, right? And people may do that. In some ways, it's rare, it says. Although possibly for a truly good person, one might have the courage to die, to stand in the gap. To take the bullet for someone else. But look at what it says in verse 8 of Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf while we were still sinners. We were not standing as some person truly good and righteous. But we, while we were yet rebels, Messiah laid his life down for us. There were since we now come to be considered righteous by means of his bloody sacrificial death, 
How much more will we be delivered through him from the anger of God's judgment? For if we were reconciled with God through his son's death, when we were enemies, how much more will we be delivered by his life now that we are reconciled? I mean, that's amazing. He says, we were reconciled with God through the Messiah's death. How much more will we be delivered by his life now that we are reconciled? And then this verse that follows, verse 11. And not only will we be delivered in the future, but we are boasting about God right now because he has acted through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, through whom we have already received reconciliation. Here's how it works, he says. It was through one individual that sin entered this world and through sin, death. And in this way, death passed through the whole human race in as much as everyone sinned. But then he says that God in one person, in Messiah, brought redemption for us. The free gift of God is not like the offense for if because of one man's offense many died, then how much more has God's grace, that is, the gracious gift of one man, Yeshua the Messiah, overflow to many? And it's just a very powerful presentation to recognize that God not only wants us to be in a position of no longer abandoned, but he is wanting to bring us back not to bring us back and then ignore us, but to bring us back because he has a plan for each one of us to make his presence known, to allow us to be like prince and princesses before our king, our father, who wants to bestow on us all the benefits of his kingdom. And this is why he wants us to return. He's not looking to say, have us return and say, I told you so. But he wants us to experience the richness of everything he speaks about in the Torah and throughout the Tanakh, throughout the scripture, to show us a new way of living that is so amazing and so powerful. It's really quite remarkable how he does this. He's faithful to bring us through. You know, it's funny, we talk today about things in the news where everybody just repeats whatever they hear on television and then repeat that as if it's their own way of looking at it. I saw an interesting quote, and I, 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 maybe it fits in or it doesn't, but I, I, I like this quote. So he says, you know, you look at the struggle that we go through, the challenges that we go through, and uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, Consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. Interesting concept. How valuable, how precious our soul is that there's contention for it. And yet God's purpose is one of not making empty promises that the accuser of the brethren makes, that Hasatan makes, the adversary but God makes promises that he fulfills and wants to bring about in our lives. There was also a quote from C.S. Lewis, which I thought was interesting, especially when you think about how much today is not based on, you know, people say based on science, settled science, settled law, and you know that it isn't settled. People are still challenging and trying to come to terms with these different things. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, this was C.S. Lewis. He said, one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. And the fact is that God's word is able to transform our hearts. The words of people in the world around us can vary in their effectiveness. They may be effective in tearing down and bringing a sense of being abandoned and alone. They may be words that are helpful and encouraging too. 
But there is no comparison to the way that God lays out for us his plan and his desire to make these things a part of our life. And so we need to understand. I, I remember there was also an interesting quote. I remember, if I remember it correctly, it was Morgan Freeman. He said, don't accept criticism from somebody you wouldn't take advice from. And yet people criticize us or say something mean or say something that tears us down and we respond to it with a sense of being abandoned. But why would we listen to the voice of criticism from somebody who hasn't been a voice of encouragement, who hasn't been somebody we would take advice from? So now we're going to take criticism from them? And it's not to say that they are always wrong in their criticism. They may be right in their criticism. But we don't go to them for the counsel as to what to do about it, do we? We go to the Lord who cares for us in a way that nobody else in this world can care. And in the process, he brings about a transformation in our lives that we weren't necessarily looking for. But he brings that peace that passes understanding, that love that goes beyond knowledge, that joy unspeakable and full of glory. All of these things are a part of what he brings as we yield ourselves to him. And during this time, the 10 days of awe between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with Shabbat Shuvah right in the middle here, there is a call by God to return and to experience reconciliation. He says in another place, he has reconciled us to God and given us a ministry of reconciliation. We become an extension of his heart towards us, towards other people. To bring words of encouragement when all people have heard was discouraging sounds. That's like that old song. There was a... There was a what was it? Uh, buffalo were stampeding, and all of a sudden, one guy, one one buffalo stops short, and everybody crashes into him. He says, "What happened?" He said, "I thought I just heard a discouraging word." You know, it says the deer and the antelope play and all that stuff. A discouraging word can put a stop to our forward movement. But God wants to increase our movement, to increase the blessings upon us, to increase and bestow upon us all the benefits of his kingdom. And that is why every year we come together for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the days of awe. You know, and I, I mentioned this. I know I mentioned it a lot. I always mention it this time of year. But the fact that you have... It's, it's sort of like the equivalent in the church to Christmas and Easter. But Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, it's the once a year Jews that come out. Just like at Easter, you see people you never saw before in the church. Once a year. But God's desire is for us to be able to experience that abundant life every day. And, you know, I remember... Bob Dylan had a song where he said, you got to serve somebody. And no matter what, you choose to serve the Lord. You say, well, I don't want to serve the Lord. Well, you can't serve yourself. You are serving somebody because we are influenced by the things around us. We're influenced by those. But let's go with the benevolent one who cares for us and wants to bring about changes that will make for benefit in our life, our loved ones, and all those around us. We can be words of encouragement instead of scoffers that bring words of discouragement and say, well, what can you do? That's why I, I think when we use the terms in the Holocaust, when we say never again, it drives me crazy to hear the context that some people will talk about never again. Because I like what 
Netanyahu said when he says, when we say never again, we mean never again. And yet when I hear people, it's sort of like, ah, oh, it's a shame, it shouldn't happen. Ah, what can you do? That's abandonment of responsibility to stand in the gap for those who have been betrayed. We need to stand in the gap and move forward and not abandon our responsibility to what God has called us to live and to do. Not just to say, but our actions need to follow as well. And to return to the Lord our God. And how is it that we fell by our iniquities? How is he return to the Lord your God for you have fallen by your iniquities? Take with you words and return. You know, in a way, the falling by our iniquities was listening to other words, other voices other than God, and we have fallen by our iniquities. He says, take with you, in a way you could say, different words, the words of God, the encouragement that is there in his scripture, the way that he wants to impact our lives and the lives of all those we love and those we don't even know, to be able to be a voice of encouragement and empowerment. And to set the captives free. To set the captives free. From what? From their sense of abandonment. And you know what? If we're going to be abandoned in any way, abandoned, left alone, no. But abandonment itself, we can abandon ourselves to God. Abandoning all the other things, the cumbrances that are there, trying to hold us down. But be liberated to allow God to have first place in our life. And then to share that with those around us. It's not enough to say, I've got it, and that's all that matters. God and me, we're tight, everything's cool. He wants us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. And that's why Yeshua said the second man is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. We have to have that relationship with God that translates into our relationship with one another. Being a word in season to bring encouragement, to bring deliverance, to break every yoke, to break every bondage and every challenge. And sometimes the way that you break down those barriers is not by telling them that they need to break down the barriers or your problem is this, that doesn't work. But encouraging somebody to see the gift of investment that God's put in somebody and encourage that to be developed and to blossom and to have a heart to lay down our life for someone else. And by that, I don't mean you have to take a bullet for somebody. But maybe it requires us to be a little bit inconvenienced, a little bit putting aside what we want right now to step in the gap and minister the way God has ministered to us to minister to other people and to see God bring transformation and healing. The return of abandoned people carries with it not all the baggage of abandonment, but it carries with it all the hope and benefits that God wants to bestow upon his people and to bring deliverance to Jew and non-Jew alike, to bring that message of hope that we have through Messiah who laid his life down for us while we were yet rebels. I, I, that always amazes me. Does it amaze you? It amazes me that there was no guarantee. All right, I'm going to willing to lay down my life but now you got to promise me you're going to listen. <laughs> he doesn't say that to them. Maybe because history has shown that a promise doesn't mean anything when people are easily distracted and pulled away from that intimacy with God. And so he says, while we were yet rebels, he died for us. He knew that it would bring about an open door for us to be able to hear and experience returning to him and his return to us with all the benefits of his kingdom.
Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, we thank you for these portions. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for the heart that you express, as in last week's portion, that even if we were to wander to the far ends of the sky, abandoned and alone, you would go there and get us and bring us back because you love us, you care for us, you watch over us and protect us. You are a shepherd, the good shepherd, who is willing to lay his life down for his flock. Lord, we thank you that even where you leave the 99 to find the one that is strayed, to bring them back to the fold. So, Lord, we thank you that you have reached out to us and made available that access so that we can turn around and be an avenue for access to you for those who don't yet know you. Pour your spirit out in a fresh new way during this season of return and cause people to come in, not to join churches or synagogues, but to return to the one, to the lover of their soul, to experience intimacy with you as you speak so much in your word that we would know that not only that you said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, but that we would experience your residence within us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the gift of Messiah laying down his life for us so that we can be set free and see others also set free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those that are bound, to undo the heavy burdens, to bring the good news, and to bring deliverance, sight to the blind, those who need to be illuminated and understanding so that we could see and hear and do what it is you've called us to do and be. We thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Is Adonai Panavelecho Veyosem Lecho Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying Amen and Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Greet one another. Join us afterwards at the Beth Zion House for some time of extended fellowship.